All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 25th day of October in the year of our Lord, 2023. I want to uh, get back to an important subject. There's a lot going on in this world. There's a lot of things in Gaza going on. And uh, I see uh, Franklin Graham uh, took the wrong side on that issue. I mean, we have to side with the oppressed as Christians. We have to side with the oppressed because God does. We have to open our eyes to the injustice that, that is done in this world. Um, the fact that Hamas, which the word, I believe Hamas is the resistance. I believe that's what the word basically means. The resistance movement to the Israeli oppression and illegal occupation of the land. We have to understand that, that all the, uh, basically everything that Israel has occupied after 1948 is illegal. It's all illegal. All the settlements are illegal. The settlers are engaged in illegal uh, possession of, of land that doesn't belong to them. The West Bank does not belong to Israel at all, under law at all. And if you look at the area that Israel legally purchased in the years prior to 1948, things really get dicey. I couldn't figure that mess out, I'll tell you. No matter what you do, uh, and you, you cannot right the wrongs in the past because what you'll be doing is creating more injustice to the descendants of those who did it. But those who continue to do it, we are responsible for what we do today, not with the crimes of our fathers and grandfathers. Our crimes, our sins. And what I want to point out this morning is the cross changed everything, absolutely everything. Uh, there was uh, a couple of comments from Nazarenes. Uh, one lady uh, said she knew exactly what I was talking about. She grew up in that, and then she went to another church and got forward or something, and, and somebody whispered in her ear, Jesus loves you. And it changed everything for her. Yes, I, it does. It does. And I wasn't raised in that, but I was raised in pretty much dead religion, too. Uh, even though Lutheranism talks about grace and this a bit, it is, that is superficial. I think all, all religion, except what, except that relationship with God himself, is going to, at some level, revert to our righteousness and our works and our duties and our responsibilities and our keeping the commandments as the basis for our hope. And I can remember uh, the, the pastor at the little Nazarene church over here speaking of the final judgment, and he was like, sort of, well, I hope I'm good enough. And I'm like, See, this is one of the things that really, like, oh, this is not the gospel. These, these people are ignorant of the cross. Yes, there's a cross in the wall. And one of the, uh, another person objected. It, these are recent comments. I think I might have addressed them in a video just recently. Uh, by the way, somebody asked for a reference to a video on CBGM. I probably approved that. Every once in a while, I go through the videos, and I think this is you know, not relevant. This is old news. This is, so I try to prune the stuff that's not really important. And it probably got pruned because it's not really important. Not important. You don't need to worry about that stuff. You don't. <laughs> that's why it got pruned. It's not important. It's not about Christ. It's not about the cross. Uh, it doesn't affect what the scripture teaches. 
those scholarly mutilators of the Bible haven't been able to do enough damage to affect what it teaches. So just ignore it. If you got concerns, just read the King James or the New King James. Uh, if you compare it to the New American Standard, <laughs> the differences are insignificant. Not important. For everybody, you know, except for those who are digging around in that, you should be doing something important with your life <laughs> rather than that. Okay, but the, the cross changed everything. And I want to talk about that. But as far as the Nazarenes, uh, this is true as Wesleyanism is true of you know of, of the vast majority of Christianity. I'm afraid is their hope is in their own works, and their hope is in how good they are, how they have tried to keep the commandments. And it's just like I just when I heard the pastor saying this, it was like this man does not understand the gospel at all. And I had confronted, when I left, I confronted him on this stuff. And I offered, you know, give me a call. And we can sit down and talk about it. But I never got a call. Uh, the, the whole idea that it's your righteousness, your works, is the basis for your salvation, even if they don't come out openly and say that. That's what it's, we're all, I think, you know, even as a Lutheran, which is supposed to be so heavy on grace and, and anti-law, you're still taught the Ten Commandments. You grow up as a child with that being drummed into you. And the idea, whether it's deliberate or accidental, I, I remember that, a Sunday school teacher, uh, I got very thinking of what she told me then. And I'm sure if somebody had quizzed her on it, she would have corrected herself. But it was, it was a, a relationship with God based on your performance. And I think it's so easy for us to fall back into that and not realize that how our performance, all our righteousness is as filthy rags. Everything that comes out of our flesh, our natural ability is, is as filthy rags. And there's no gospel there. If you're standing before God at the final judgment or the great, uh, the great white, he shouldn't have been at the great right white throne anyway. He, he did not understand the scriptures. He's been poisoned by going to Nazarene Seminary. I've got their theology books. I know what they teach. I haven't had to go there, but I've got their books, their textbooks. Who knows what else, based on the stuff that they pump out every week to the local churches, it's humanistic more than anything else. Now, it's not what it used to be, and what it used to be was definitely heavy on personal righteousness. I think that's dying out, and now they're going seeker-sensitive because they don't have anything anymore. They have no power. There's no power of God in the Nazarenes. Or in the charismatics, either, by the way. See, they were Wesley's false doctrine of entire sanctification is a fraud because it's contrary to Scripture and it's deceived multitudes that they can seek this and obtain sinless perfection. And it's a lie. And it puts people in bondage and condemnation. So, so they'll, they'll, they'll have some experience and they think it's it and they grab on and testify, I've been entirely circum uh, circumcised, entirely sanctified. And what happens? Pretty quickly, they find out they haven't been. There is still sin in their life. And then they are plagued with guilt. And then they start living as a hypocrite. Because they can't say, yes, I still have sin. They feel ashamed. They don't have a solid relationship with Christ based on faith in him and what he did on the cross. And somebody objected, well, we, we believe in the cross. We believe in Jesus. He is not central. Your own righteousness is central in the holiness movement, among Wesleyans, among Roman Catholics. They don't understand the gospel. None of them. 
I just want to share it. Like, like the one woman that grew up in that, she confessed. So, suddenly, the simple words, Jesus loves you, open her eyes. Of course, it was the Holy Spirit that opened her eyes and opened her ears to hear that. Because you can hear it all your life and not understand it. It's about knowing him and what he's done for us. So let's go over to the scripture briefly. I'm going to try to keep this fairly short rather than do an ex extent. I want to keep, you know, keep going. But uh, 2 Corinthians, we, I could go all kinds of places with this, but 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Starting at verse 14. So I'm going to give you some context. Verse 14 through the end of the chapter. And you can see, see the highlighted word there. For the love of Christ, this is the Apostle Paul uh, writing, of course. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live may uh, should live no longer to themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. I'm not going to try to explain all this, just as the immediate context here. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, talking about the apostles, not necessarily himself, but talking about, you know, the, the Jewish uh, witnesses of Jesus. Yet now we know him thus no longer. So we, Christ is no longer physically with us. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. If anyone is in Christ, haven't I, I've been trying to hammer that in. In Christ, in Christ, the atonement, everything is in Christ. He is the creator. He is the center of all things. All things are from him and for him and to him. He is the connection between God and everything else, between God and creation, between God and us. He is the face of God. He is God interacting with us. He is both God and man. He is the interface. The, he is Christianity. Anything that distracts from him is wrong. We're wasting our time anyplace else, really. Because in him is life. In him is the, our, our forgiveness. In him is all the gifts and promises of God. They're all true in him. They're yes and amen in Christ. To be in Christ by faith is to have it all. Therefore, if anyone is in, is in Christ, he is a new creation. That's the promises of the new covenant. In Ezekiel 36 and Jeremiah 31, what God will do, he will make a new covenant. That's what Christ died on the cross to bring that in, where he will transform us. He'll give us a new heart. He'll take out the heart of stone. And boy, this world needs to have a lot of hearts of stone removed. And write his laws, his will on our hearts and put a new spirit in us. A new heart and a new spirit and put himself in us, his spirit in us. And he will be our God, and we will be his people. Truly his people, his children. A new creation. While we're in this mortal body, we're still housed in this old tent that comes from Adam. Our flesh in which the sin of Adam still dwells. With our physical brains and our physical bodies and our physical senses tied to this physical world. But we are a new creation if you've been born again. That new creation does not sin because it's made in the likeness of God, in Christ. But all this that we have is in Christ. 
And if we are in Christ, we have it, and we abide in Christ by faith. So if we don't walk in faith and we walk according to our senses, according to our flesh in this world, well, even though we are saved, we are not walking in that salvation. You walk in the Spirit. You walk in the new creation by faith in Christ, trusting God to do it in us. It's not us exerting ourselves. It's God exerting himself in us. Our exert. Our effort is to trust him. With, that's it. He does the work. We trust him to do the work. Now, all things are of God. Now, all things, somebody could take that and take it someplace where Paul's not intending to go with that. All these things are of God, the new creation, all these things. Creation itself, as God created it. Even the capacity for human beings to rebel. The freedom God gave us, because we were created in his image. God's not a slave, God's free. But with the fall, we lost an awful lot of that. We became slaves. Christ came to set us free. See, God is not a slave. See, you can't be a Calvinist and believe in the God of the Bible. You just can't do it. Sorry, people out there. You may think you're a Calvinist, but you don't really. If you actually understand what Calvin, Calvin says about God and what the Westminster Confession says about God, you have to leave that. You have to leave it. It's not the five points. That's, you know, that's not really that bad. It is, but it's based on that core that is rotten. It is a blasphemy against God. And I know they would jump on that expression, all things are of God. Well, you have to read it in context. What's he talking about? The new creation, all these things we have in Christ. Read it in context, please. Learn how to do that. Practice it. Watch how Chris Roseboro does it. He's pretty good at it. Old things have passed away. See, the, all things have become new. All things are of God. He has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and given us the ministry of reconciliation. Paul is a servant of God's work of reconciling humanity to himself. That is, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not imputing their trespasses to him, to them, but committing, uh, but has committed to us the word of reconciliation. For we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. You have to be reconciled. To what what is required to do that? Trust Him. Believe in what Christ did for you on the cross. For he made him who knew no sin. God made Christ, Son of God, Son of Man. The Son of Man, who is God, but Son of Man, God in the flesh. Who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Okay, the righteousness of God is a righteousness that God gives us to, gives us, as Paul explains in Romans. It's counted to us. Our faith is reckoned as righteousness. God gives us his righteousness. He counts us as righteous if we believe in him. Because Christ purchased the righteousness for us. All right, so God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. The cross changed everything. And if we, if we look to ourselves as for our standing before God, we're toast. Brothers and sisters, we're committing the sin of Galatians. We're not trusting in Christ, what he did on our behalf. And this is just, I'm just looking at this one verse here, really. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. What was God doing on the cross? Well, Paul talks about it, that he might be both just, 
See, not ignoring sin, because God is holy and just. He couldn't just ignore it, but what he had, and he had said the wages of sin is death, break the law and you shall die, eat of that tree and you shall die. But what did he do? He took the punishment of the law upon himself. The creator, Jesus is the creator, took the penalty of his law upon himself. The judge suffered the penalty on our behalf because of God's love and mercy so that God could treat us as if we weren't sinners and rebels. So God could treat us with mercy and love and reconcile us to himself, reconciling his enemies to himself. While we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. And when we lose sight of that and go do other things, not understanding what Christ has done, what God has done in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, satisfying his own self, satisfying his justice on the cross, in our stead, himself bearing the penalty. The physical death of Christ bears the penalty for our sin. Don't call yourself a Christian if that's not central. If, if you're trusting in what you've done, you're not trusting in Christ. Just like a, a, a man at the, he's gone now, I'm sure, at the nursing home that we used to minister on in on Sunday morning. I hadn't even, you know, I was just walking down the halls, asking people if they want to come to, to church service, because they were all sh always shorthanded on on Sunday mornings. If somebody was wanted to go, I'd wheel them there, and they'd go look for somebody else. Uh, not trying to force anybody to come. No, if somebody doesn't want to go, that's that's their issue. I don't have, you know, it's, trying to drag somebody to church is a lost cause anyway. I mean, if they're not interested, they're not interested. And uh, just leave them alone. God will deal with them sooner or later. <laughs> if they're interested, then yeah, because they couldn't really roll themselves down there too easily. But he just started, you know, he wasn't really interested in that, but he started telling me that that he was uh, apparently Church of Christ. He took, was going on about what church that he went to, and it was at that time it had already closed. I said, yeah, I know where that church is. And then he was saying that uh, that that he had. Every, he had always gone to church every Sunday. So he was telling me his hope of salvation is what he was doing. That I, I always went to church, but then he would always correct himself. Well, almost always. And then he said, yeah, I always gave my offerings. And then he started recounting the, uh, his sin. Like I was a little, when I was a little boy, I, I stole some of the pennies. So while he was testifying of his own righteousness, the Spirit of God was reminding him of his sin. And it was like, but his hope, his own, he, he didn't mention the cross in Christ once. And this is my opinion of the churches of Christ. This is, guy is, is an example of what I have heard and experienced there. And it's so bad. They are trusting in themselves and trusting in sacraments. They're trusting in being baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins. What they do, there are five things you do to get saved. And they put all their hope in water baptism. They're Roman Catholics without a pope. Trusting in themselves. If I do these five things, the last thing is live the Christian life. Yeah, well, that means something. You can't do that unless you're born again. You can't do that without trusting in Christ and what he did on the cross. It's not a, a thing to get you saved. It's a relationship with God through Christ. 
you've been reconciled to God in Christ. And you and through faith in him, without faith, there is no reconciliation because you're not in Christ. It's only in Christ. Everything is in Christ. If you're in Christ, you got it all. If you're not in Christ, you don't have anything. Judgment will be on whether or not you are in Christ, whether or not you've trusted in him. All your sins were paid for on the cross. Past, present, and future. As long as you trust in Christ, you don't really have to worry about them. You shouldn't obsess about them. It's realize that, yeah, there's still sin in my mortal body, and Father, help me. God, forgive me. You know, but it's, it's, that is not... You know, when, when we ask God to forgive us, it's not because we have a broken relationship with him. We're just ashamed of something we did that we know is wrong, and we don't do it intentionally anyway, but it's, it's just a matter of getting our, putting ourselves back into a place where we recognize. What we need to do is recognize that Christ died for that and not hang on to our failures because then we will pull back, we will draw back if we are obsessed with our sin, but rather realize it's all paid for and just, God, cleanse me, change me, fix me, fulfill your new covenant in me. And any, any group that doesn't focus on Christ and the cross and what he's accomplished for us, stay away, just stay away. I mean, it's, you know, I'm sure some, I hope that some place there's a Nazarene church and some place there's a Catholic church and some place there's a Baptist church that actually preaches Christ and Christ crucified and understands the gospel. But I can't examine everyone. <laughs> so sometimes I'm generalizing. I'm generalizing. Uh, again, my, my experience with Nazarenes and my experience with Church of Christ and a bunch of other things and Catholics their trust isn't in Christ. Now, there's, I'm sure there's some individuals that they are. They, they do trust. They, they see this stuff, but they know it's Christ. And in their heart, it's Christ. But there's a lot of other people, when you, when you talk to them, they're, they're really looking at something other than him to satisfy God, the, the hope in God. Well, I hope, I hope, I hope, because of all the things I get, because I almost always attended church. And only seldom stole from the offering. You know, these kind of things that, that you're trusting in imperfect performance anyway. And that's why the scripture says in Isaiah, God says, all our righteousness is as filthy rags. Never acceptable to God. Even as Christians, our work is mixed with our flesh. Our, our desires are not 100% pure. Not all the time. We have self-interest. We have desires that are, are not from God necessarily, or we, we don't treat people the way we should all the time. And I get impatient with my wife and sometimes yell, sometimes raise my voice. I'm not intending to do it, but, you know, but it just, I live in a, a body of flesh in which sin dwells. I'm not disconnected from it yet. So, but my, my righteousness does not consist in that. It consists in Christ. And that is where Calvinists are correct. They understand that. Lutherans, when they're right-minded, understand that. Baptists, when they don't get distracted by other things, tend to understand that.
Wesleyans, no. Roman Catholics, no. Individuals may, but as the system, no. And that's what I was trying to get to. And uh, I don't want to extend this any farther. 30 minutes, that's, that's plenty of time. So this is, it's Christ. It's, he is the center. He is Christianity. Your relationship with him your relationship with God through him. Christ, God was on the cross satisfying himself, satisfying his justice, satisfying the requirements of the law, paying the penalty of sin himself in Christ. He is your righteousness. He is your salvation. He is eternal life. If you're in him, if you have that relationship with Christ, then you are a Christian, if Christ is in you. If he's not, you don't belong to him. That's what the Scripture says. That's what Paul teaches. That's why he was so upset with the Galatians, because they were deviating from that and putting their trust in Christ plus, Christ plus circumcision in that case. It doesn't matter what else the plus is if it's not Christ alone. If your hope is in, in part, your own righteousness, then it's not fully in Christ. And you're saying, essentially, that Jesus is not enough. What he did on the cross is not enough. I have to add to it. Do you understand? how offensive that is to God. What God did in his Son, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to die on that bloody cross in order that all who are believers in him should not perish but have eternal life. It's what God did, and it's what God does in us. He is our salvation. If you don't have a relationship with him, see, a relationship with the church can't save you. A relationship with, with whatever can't save you. Only a relationship with God is salvific. He is the one who saves. He is the one who desires to save you. He is the one at work in you to save you and to keep you and to transform you into the image of his Son. 